Ladies and gentlemen, Rick Rashid. Thank you, President Cohen. That was really very sweet, very wonderful. Uh, you know, as, as President Cohen was talking about the uh, Wien Hall, I was reminded of the, uh, the first immigration course where I had to stand up as a young faculty member, you know, and talk about my research for the, for the graduate students to try to convince them to work for me or with me, uh, you know, during that uh, coming, coming year. And, uh, and of course, that was back in Wien Hall in, in the, one of those wonderful cinder block uh, classrooms that we had. This is probably 5409. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then I look at this room and I say, wow, it's, it, things have really gotten better. You know, <laughs> you know the, the unlikely sequence of events that uh, brought me to Carnegie Mellon uh, back in 1979, so that's 30 years ago exactly this year. Uh, that unlikely sequence of events you know, could probably best be described as fate. Uh, I was a graduate student at uh, the University of Rochester, and, and we were very lucky there that we were the first place outside of, of Xerox to have access to Xerox Altos and uh, the three megabit experimental ethernet you know, back in the mid you know, to late 1970s. And so I developed a, a series of skills associated with building systems uh, you know, uh, distributed systems and using local area networks and using Altos. Uh, as it so happened, uh, as the story was told to me, Raj Reddy was uh, at an event with uh, Jerry Feldman, who had started the department at the University of Rochester, and was sort of asking, do you have any good students that are graduating that may have some of these skills? Uh, and Jerry said, well, yes, actually, I do. There's this Rick Rashid and Eugene Ball. and. Uh, and so after, I, I was just coming back from my interview loop uh, uh, looking for a job and uh, was starting to think about you know, which of the places I visited, none of which were CMU, uh, which of the places I visited were, were the ones I, I, I wanted to think more about and, and choose. And then I got this call from Raj you know, trying to convince me to, to come up to uh, Carnegie Mellon, which I really hadn't thought much about at all uh, before that. And uh, he had, they had this, this great project they wanted to start called the SPICE Project, Scientific Personal Integrated Computing Environment. It was my first introduction to really long acronyms. <laughs> and uh, and so, so I, you know, I, drove, I drove down, I met up with Raj. Uh, you know, he took me around on a whirlwind tour. You know, I met with Scott Fallman and, and I think Howard, were you, I think you were on the loop for that and, and, and a number of other people. And, uh, and it was, it, it, it was fairly clear to me that they that 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 this was an Raj was doing something unusual. I was kind of being snuck in through the system. I'm not sure exactly how that worked, but uh, but needless to say, uh, you know, they uh, uh, made me an offer. They, I got really excited about the, the prospects of coming to, to Carnegie Mellon. And frankly, I think the thing that got me the most excited about the prospects of coming here was the audacity of the department in terms of what it was willing to undertake. Um, the, the vision uh, behind some of the projects the department had done, you know, C.MMP, CM Star, uh, and, and what they wanted to do with, with SPICE was just, you know, it was tremendous. It, it was, they really wanted to change, you know, what personal computing was going to be like in a scientific, uh, academic uh, setting. And, and that really appealed to me, and the idea that you could, you could really make an enormous difference, you could take on a really large project, and I felt that CMU was the kind of place that was willing to do it. Uh, but even, even more important to me as I came here wasn't just the audacity of what the department was willing to undertake, the risk that it was willing to take uh, to advance science, but it was also the trust that existed uh, between the, the, the members of this community. I mean, people, I really felt that people uh, cared about each other in the department, whether they were in your area or not. Uh, they were willing to invest, even in a young, new you know, research scientist uh, coming from, from uh, a small uh, computer science department. They were willing to invest a lot of trust in me uh, to you know, come in, you know, build a, a, a distributed computing environment around local area networking, you know, train uh, uh, student, train staff, 
uh, and then build an operating system for this new scientific personal computing environment. You know, and, it, and, and the fact that there was that trust, the fact that you felt that the faculty and the students you know, really believed in each other and were willing to trust each other to work together to accomplish a large goal, in some sense, I think made it possible for me and the others uh, that were involved to do more than we probably would have been able to do any other way. And we felt the, a responsibility to live up to that trust. And I think that was a, a critical part of the success of certainly my early career here. Now, uh, President Cohen mentioned this uh, link <laughs> article. And, uh, you know, I don't really know when this picture was taken exactly. It pretty much had to be taken like the first year I was here uh, because it has the concept terminal. <laughs> Uh, for those who remember the old concept terminals. Uh, and uh, the, uh, it, it really was a, um, you know, that's, a, that's the old office I was in. I think it was down, you know, sort of in the bowels of Wien Hall. Uh, and you know, the good news is I didn't really have to spend much time in that office because uh, I found one of the other nice aspects of, of uh, the old Wien Hall was that it was such a labyrinth, there were rooms that no one had ever found before. Uh, and there was this, there, and Howard remembers this, there was a, Howard Wackler, there was, a, there was this um, sort of a secret room uh, in, the, in, in the machine room area that for some reason no one seemed to have ever used for anything. So I moved one of the altos into that room and it was my secret place that I could go and work and no one even knew that I was there. Uh, for a young faculty member, having a place you can escape uh, is actually a really good thing. I got a lot of programming done um, in that location. Uh, now the geeky look thing has come back. Uh, <laughs> you know, so sadly, 30 years ago, it wasn't really in style. Uh, you know, after, after just a few years at Carnegie Mellon, I was looking a lot better. You know, I found a barber. Uh, and uh, that's an old micro, that's a microvac. So this would probably have been about the, you know, mid 80s, as I would guess, or thereabouts. I still have those weird um, dinosaur things that are in my house in Seattle, and I uh, probably still have some of the books and, and magazines and things that are on that shelf. I don't really throw a whole lot away, uh, which, uh, and I just wanted to just <laughs> say, what did Carnegie Mellon really mean to me? You know, <laughs> This is the before, and this is the after, okay? And, you know, I, I, that's, that's, that's you know, all I can really say. Uh, now, the, you know, obviously one of the major things I did when I was here, um, working with a lot of great you know, faculty and students, a number of whom are in, the, in this audience, uh, was to really take um, uh, ideas from a system I'd done as a graduate student um, at the University of Rochester called RIG, for Rochester Intelligent Gateway, um, and, and sort of rethink those ideas in the, in the context of, of this sort of new era of personal computing. Um, and that is when I developed something called the, the Accent Operating System. Uh, and, and then that led directly, that was really designed for the PERCs, for those people that remember the PERCs, uh, the Three Rivers Corporation PERCs. Uh, the, that was really then led directly to, um, in a few years, the development of the mock operating system, which has really become you know, much more famous than any of the previous ones. What I think was really interesting, and again, I think that it was the environment here at Carnegie Mellon that really allowed this to happen, is that you know, the approach that, that was taken with these systems was one of, of really you know, having a, a fundamental set of abstractions upon which you could build a larger operating system environment. Typically, in the operating system space, people don't worry so much about the, the sort of basic abstractions of the operating system. They sort of say, well, what can I do at this level that supports the level above that? And how do I fit the pieces together? You know, mock and, well, Accent and Mock were really uh, attempts at saying, if, if I come up with a very fundamental set of mechanisms and abstractions, can I then build everything from that? You know, and even more so, you know, can I even think about building it itself from those same abstractions? So I, can I make this completely recursive uh, intellectually? And so that was one of the things I think that really distinguished Mach and Accent from the systems that came before it. But also I think it's, it, it's a statement about you know, the, 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 the notion that 
it was important to try to create something that was intellectually elegant and that made sense um, and that this was an environment in which one could actually do that and not be sort of put in a, in a box that said, well, no, you really can't do it quite that way. You've got to do it some other way instead. Um, so I, I felt really good about that. You know, in terms of some of the key um, elements of these systems, I mean, one thing people often refer to, and you see it, you'll see it uh, in, a, in some of the chapters in various uh, operating system books that talk about mock, uh, you know, people will refer to the term microkernel, but generally speaking, most people don't really remember what it actually meant. Um, in the original accent work, uh, the, many of the underlying operating systems and primitives, primitives were actually implemented in microcode. And in fact, when we started the SPICE project, as Rajwell remembers, you know, we, we felt that you had to have microcode in the machine um, in order to be able to achieve the performance that we were looking for. Um, and so that's where the term microkernel really came from. But most people misinterpreted that as meaning small kernel. Um, and so today, more often than not, people say, well, gee, it wasn't that small. Uh, and, and they're right, but, it, but, but again, it was a different, different term. Uh, the, you know, the notion of machine independence and support for different kinds of, of architectures. My sister's name is Norma, by the way. <laughs> uh, I invented these terms uh, in my office on the seventh floor of Wheat Hall because I, I couldn't, no, none of the other, other faculty members knew the, you know, ha had good names for those architectures. Uh, and so I said, okay, well, this will be like, you know, there actually sort of was a good name for Yuma. That's a uniform memory access architecture. NUMA was sort of non-uniform memory access architectures. There wasn't really a good name for that. And that name's really stuck. And NORMA was sort of the, the, the distributed no remote memory access architecture. So those are, th this name stuck. The other two really didn't. Uh, but at least I got my sister's name in there. So, you know, you can't, can't, can't do too bad. But, but I think, again, the key, thing, the key idea behind mock was this notion that you could build a system out of a, of a small set of basic abstractions. You could layer a number of things around that. You could put it on a wide variety of different machines, um, and then you could support different kinds of operating systems uh, on top of that. Um, now, I'm going to, I found an old video, and I'm going to show. Uh, so, in this uh, basically, what I'm trying to do this, this is an old video I found uh, just lying around. I had it transcribed into a, in a digital form. I'm sorry it's not very uh, clear anymore, but it's an old VHS tape. Um, this is Mach running on a Next machine. So in um, 1986, Steve Jobs and, and, and Next decided to use Mach as a basis for the Next computer. Uh, and so they took the Mach kernel at that point, uh, used it as the basis for their Next Step operating system. And this is just showing off the fact that it's running and it was cool and it looked really interesting. Um, again, the, 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 that's more like 1986. This is mock running on a microvax, so yet a completely different architecture, um, a completely different system, um, you know. And this now is, let's see if it pops up here. This is mock running on a Macintosh uh, back, this would probably have been about 1988, is my, I'm guessing, 1987. Uh, and Again, what was interesting about this was just that we could do it and that we were able then to layer the entire Mac OS operating system on top of that and run it. So all, I'm, all this little video is doing is just showing that, um, that it actually worked, you know, which is really a lot of what you show when you do operating system presentations. Uh, there isn't really a whole lot else to show, so, you know. <laughs> I think I just want to skip over to something here. All this is trying to show that it actually worked and actually worked pretty well. Um, and in fact, this is uh, you know Dark Castle running on a Mac, and Mac OS running on top of Mach, you know on a on a Macintosh. So, gives you a sense of the fact that it was it was working. And then lastly, here if I skip forward a bit, um, this is uh, this is Mach running on a an, an old PC. Uh, this is an old, uh, luggable, you know, plasma, you know, orange plasma display PC. And you, know, you can see kind of the, the, the yes, it does in fact work. Um, so the fact that Mach could be moved to so many architectures, you know, gave it in, in many ways both, uh, you know, a lot more longevity 
uh, and ha allowed it to have a greater influence than it might otherwise have had. Um, many of you know that the current version of the Mac OS, actually I just pulled this off of Wikipedia, um, the current version of Mac OS uh, actually sits on top of the, of the Mach 3.0 kernel that was developed here. Uh, and so if you have a Mac or if you have an iPhone, um, you're actually running code that I and my graduate students were writing back in 1983. Uh, and if you were to have asked me in 1983, uh, do you realize, or, t or just told me, do you realize that someday the code that you're writing would run on a cell phone? You know, I would say, uh, what's a cell phone? <laughs> <laughs> Which is another way of saying, you know, software can actually have a much longer life than you ever really intended and often winds up showing up on devices you never imagined it would show up on. And who knows what will happen. I mean, today uh, there are versions of Unix that are based on Mach. Mach was the first 64-bit version of Unix, so there are a lot of, of implementations based on that. Uh, Mach was part of a, a central you know, business competition between IBM and, and AT&T and Sun and Digital and a bunch of other companies you know, back in the 1980s. You know, we got used as a as, as, as weaponry uh, in that battle. Uh, and as a result, again, you know, things, you know, the mock became digital Unix. It became the basis for uh, uh, compacts uh, Unix and, uh, and for, uh, after the acquisition, HP's True64 Unix. So it's, it sort of had a life in many different forms. Uh, probably very few people know this, but in fact, Accent and Mock also were both part of the reason I wound up at Microsoft. Uh, but also they, they led in some sense to Microsoft making the investment in what became Windows NT. Uh, because there's an early project in the mid, what, 1986 timeframe at Microsoft where they actually took Accent, they actually had perks at Microsoft. Uh, they were running Accent, they took Mock, they ran it on, on Vaxxas. Uh, and it was, a, it was the inspiration uh, for making the investment that became the Windows NT investment, you know, bringing in Dave Cutler, building that whole, that whole environment. So, so in some sense, we've have been able to have an influence uh, on a number of different uh, systems, whether it's PCs, Unix systems, uh, or Macintosh systems over time. Now I mentioned, you know, there was an unlikely sequence of events that got me to, my, to uh, Carnegie Mellon. There was an equally unlikely sequence of events uh, that uh, that got me to Microsoft in 1991. Uh, Gordon Bell, who's in the audience, probably uh, remembers that he called me at home at dinner time. Uh, back, it probably would have been about March or April of 1991. And you know, these, you know, when when people call you at dinner time, you know, your first assumption is you know they're trying to sell you something. Uh, you know, which was true. He was trying to sell me something, but. Uh, but you have to understand, he, it was Gordon Bell, right? So I had to take the phone call. So I got up from the dinner table. I went up to the third floor of my, my place in, in Shadyside. And I, I took this phone call from Gordon. Because you, know, you just can't hang up on Gordon Bell, OK? Uh, and uh, I'm sure he was counting on that. Uh, and Gordon had been, had been, was working with Nathan Mirabold at Microsoft, uh, looking for someone to become director of the, a new research lab that they wanted to create. And, uh, Mostly, I was very polite and said no, uh, but Gordon convinced me to at least have him and Nathan show up in my office you know, a few weeks later, and Gordon remembers all this very well, and, uh, and, and talk to me there. Right? So again, I was very polite. You know, they showed up. I was very nice to them. Uh, and, uh, and I said, well, you know, I'm not really interested in doing anything like this, but you know, you know, Microsoft, you know, back when um, you know, in, in those days, Microsoft was an awfully small company uh, compared to what it, would be, what it is today. And it wasn't really clear to me that they were really serious about doing basic research. But they prevailed upon me to actually go visit Microsoft. So kind of, you know, keep, keeping the whole thing going. This is part of the, how you negotiate with someone. Uh, and so we, uh, so I went to Microsoft and, and, I, and I came back and in some sense, I still said no. Uh, I came back and said no. But, but I also came back with a sense of, you know, this is a company much like Carnegie Mellon that had an audacity to dream about things that could be done that in some sense seemed crazy. Uh, they, they, and yet there was an energy 
there was an excitement, there was a belief in what you could do and what you'd accomplish. Uh, and, and the feeling that there was that same kind of trust. I mean, every, every executive I spoke to on that visit, you know, had clearly read research papers, they were involved in the field, they understood the meaning of doing basic research. And, and so, you know, that, that kind of weighed on my thinking. And um, eventually, and I won't go with all the details of how I made the decision, but eventually I decided to go to Microsoft. Uh, my official decision was on September 1st of 1991. That's how we date the beginning of Microsoft research. And uh, we've just had our 18th anniversary. Um, and and I, it, when I started Microsoft research, I would have been really happy you know, getting to you know, 100, 150 people, having a great little research lab. I, I, in, at no point would I have envisioned that we would have gotten to where we are today. I mean, today we have over 850 uh, PhD researchers working in six different locations around the world. Uh, many of the people that I knew uh, back in those days as a, as a faculty member now work for me, um, including Gordon. And, you know, uh, and again, you know, the, you know, we have more members of the National Academy of Engineering than most universities. Uh, you know, last time I checked, we had more than the University of Washington. Uh, we have you know, some of the, you know, the most interesting, most uh, exciting researchers in many different research areas. And um, that's, again, you know, the, the growth of the organization is something I really wouldn't have imagined. My view of Microsoft Research was really based on my experiences at Carnegie Mellon. And the mission statement you know, for Microsoft Research could have just as easily, except for the Microsoft part, could just as easily have been a mission statement for Carnegie Mellon. I mean, the key thing was move the state of the art forward. And then when you had great ideas, get them into practice. Make something happen. Change the world with what you do. Um, and that's been our mission statement for 18 years. And I've had the, the luxury, I think, of being one of the longest sitting, you know, heads of a major research lab ever. Um, so I've had the opportunity to keep that mission and the focus for that, for that period of time. Uh, it was very much a CMU style organization. And I, I, the way I think of that is that, you know, it, we, we really built around the concept of critical mass groups. You know, we, we brought in senior people to create new areas. Uh, we had a reasonable person principle. We really, you know, believed in people. We didn't, we didn't put a lot of bureaucracy in their way. We, we don't, we didn't and don't have budgets for research projects. Uh, that was true pretty much for CMU back in the 80s. Uh, it's a little hard to do that now. The GAO is a little bit more excited um, than it used to be. But, the, um, but at Microsoft, I can do that, right? And so I can, I, can, I can have that sort of sense of collegiality within the organization where no one has to worry about, you know, if I, if, if I do something good, you know, will I get more resources? Or if someone else does something good and I help them, will they get more and I get less? You know, I can have that kind of an atmosphere. Uh, so, I mean, these are really key. And I think this part, too, goes back to what I was saying earlier about the, my experience when I was at CMU, feeling that I was mentored very well. I mean, people, people gave me great advice. Raj gave me great advice. Alan Newell gave me great advice. Nico Haberman gave me great, great advice. Uh, you know, I was mentored very well. I was, I, I was trusted to make things happen. And I think that's something that I, that I feel is important in, in our organization as well and something I've tried to preserve. Uh, we tried to, we've tried to keep a flat model. It's hard now. The organization has 1,500 people in it. Um, it's hard to keep a very completely flat organization. But we, we try to keep it as flat as we can. We're very aggressive about being part of the academic community and doing peer-reviewed research. That's critical to our success. Um, and we really believe in bringing in a lot of outside people from university environments um, and giving back to the university community. And over the history of Microsoft Research, more than 15% of all the money I've been given by the company to do basic research has gone directly to universities. I think that's a, a huge number uh, when you think about you know, what, what that actually means over the years. The, uh, we have the largest PhD intern program in the world. And, and really, the, uh, during the summers, I believe we're the largest academic computer science organization in the world. We have 850 faculty and 1,000 PhD students. Uh, so it's, it's just an enormous. Uh, uh, opportunity for us to work with all those students, but I think it's also incredibly valuable for the students, not just because they get to work with, with great people that we have, uh, but also, frankly, because they get to know each other and they get to learn from each other and be, they build relationships that are going to last a lifetime. 
because those are the people that are going to be the professors and the research scientists of the, of the future. Uh, I always love slides like this because it's one of the few things I can do at Microsoft where I can talk about market share uh, <laughs> just the same way as, as my colleagues in the product groups. You know, we have a great market share of, uh, of, of basic research. I, this is really an old slide. That's why everything says 2008. Except, but the, last night, I, I threw in the um, SOSP result, because SOSP is uh, just next month at, in Big Sky, Montana. And we'll have uh, uh, almost a third of all the papers uh, will have a Microsoft author there. And that's, that's a really great result. And I think from my perspective, this is just a statement about how much we care about publication, how much we care about you know, being part of that environment. Now, I, sometimes I, I, I feel a little bit like a voice in the wilderness you know, within the, the industrial research world, you know, arguing for really unfettered basic research, because that's what we do, and that's what we believe in, and that comes from my experiences at Carnegie Mellon and the environment that existed here. Uh, you know, a lot of people misunderstand, you know, why you do basic research. You know, they sort of look at the great work coming out of CMU, or coming out of MIT, or coming out of Stanford, or even coming out of us, and they'll say, wow, that's fabulous. You know, that means you know, more patents. That means great technology that, that can go into our products or new products. You know, that means you're going to have all these smart people to fix problems. You know, it means we're going to be able to know what's going to happen in the future and we can target our, our, our company around that. And, and those things are all consequences of having a great research organization. You know, they're consequences. I mean, that's, those are some of the things that come out of Carnegie Mellon in the great environment that you have here. Uh, there are things that come out of our group. But people will look at that, especially business people, uh, people in the industrial research, in the industrial world, and they'll say, great, I want that. That's what I want from you. And so can we, can you just do more of those things? Okay, because uh, I want the output uh, of the research organization. And they start to think about managing research using this as their desired output goal. And in an industrial environment, when you manage research to get a specific result, inevitably you get less, right? Uh, there was a, and I'm not gonna pick on, on Google too much, but um, there was a conversation one of our researchers, Eric Horvitz, had. Uh, he was introduced to Larry Page at a conference in 2008. And uh, rather than Larry saying, hi, how are you, and being polite, uh, he said, you do it all wrong. Uh, and, and Eric said, uh, okay, uh, what do you mean? He said, well, the right way of doing research is you have researchers embedded with product people. You know, they all have to be working together. And I, it's a paraphrase, so don't quote me exactly. And you know, there are a lot of people that believe that, and that is actually a perfectly fine way of doing technology transfer. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that idea. It's a great way of getting technology transfer. But at the end of the day, it's, it's you know, like killing the goose that laid the golden egg, right? You probably will find another golden egg inside the goose. You may even find two, if it's prolific. Uh, but that's all you're getting. Then you need a, a new goose, right? And I think that's the problem, is when people think about research in terms of only the output, um, they don't realize what research is really for. And I think, you know, in, in my philosophy, you know, this is what research is for. It's for making sure you're still around, you know, making sure that you survive, whether the you is a company, whether the you is a society uh, or a country. Um, it's making sure that you've made the intellectual investments that will let you change rapidly if there's, in the, in the words of Anavir Bush, if there's a war, if there's a disease, um, if there's famine, or in the case of a company, if there's a new competitor, a new business model, or a new technology. You know, those are the things that I think are really important. And that's sort of, the, that's, that's our belief system and my belief system. And I really, you know, that sort of came in from my experiences here at CMU. Now, a building like this and, a, and an auditorium like this, in some sense, is all about the future. Okay, it's about the next generation. And this is sort of my next generation. You've met a couple of them already. There's my two youngest boys. Uh, my son, uh, Danny, was a, a, 
a graduate student here for a couple of years getting his master's degree. Now he just started a job in Manhattan, New York City, getting a really nice salary. Thank you, thank you, CMU. Uh, you know, there's my, my oldest son, Ferris, who many of you uh, remember walking the halls and you, with a screwdriver and trying to unscrew the panels off of perks. Uh, and there's my daughter, Kira, who's now an uh, um, undergraduate at uh, the University of Washington and doing some interesting work in Arabic studies. But I, I wanted to show you this picture as the very last thing I'll show you. Uh, this is my son, Tiran. Uh, he's at his laptop. He's programming in Visual Studio 2008 in C Sharp. Uh, and this is uh, something his mother, my wife Terry, taught him. And, uh, and it gives you a sense of you know, what, you know, what the future might hold. You know, 30 years from now, you know, maybe he will be you know, in this auditorium uh, lecturing. Or maybe it'll be one of your children. Or maybe it'll be one of grandchildren. Uh, but that's why we make these kinds of investments. You know, these kinds of investments in basic research and the infrastructure basic research are really about the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>